We have a binder to hand out. May I approach the witness with it? May indeed. David Blankenhorn. And B L A N K E N H O R N. And your first name? David. D A V I D. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Blankenhorn. Hi. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, I'd like you to turn to tab one in the binder that's in front of you. And, Your Honor, this is uh, the declaration of. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, and I'd like you to turn back to page, actually it's not a numbered page, but it's right behind page 25. Is that, is that your CV, Mr. Blankenhorn? Yes, sir. Your Honor, behind tab A in the binder, we have created a new exhibit that is just Mr. Blankenhorn's CV. It's exhibit uh, DIX 2693, and we would move that into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, tw DIX 2693 is admitted. <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn, uh, would you please uh, briefly describe your educational background for the court? I graduated from high school in Salem, Virginia in 1973. I graduated from college, uh, from Harvard College in 1977 with a, a degree in social studies. And I graduated in 1979 with an MA in history from the University of Warwick in Coventry, England. And did you receive any honors? As an undergraduate, I received the honor of magna cum laude and is with a, my MA degree is with, they called it with distinction. <clears throat> Sorry? I didn't hear what you It said. was uh, called with distinction, uh, MA with dis distinction. And uh, did you receive any fellowships? I received a uh, John Knox fellowship as an undergraduate uh, to, for a year of study abroad. <clears throat> and, and were you on a, that fellowship at the University of Warwick? Yes, sir. Uh, after your uh, graduation, uh, uh, from the University of Warwick, uh, what did you do then? I served two years uh, in the uh, VISTA program, Volunteers in Service to America, where I worked as a community organizer in several uh, communities in uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And then for the next four years, I worked as a, after VISTA, I continued my work as a community organizer in several different communities in uh, Massachusetts and in Virginia. And what, uh, what did your work uh, in, in these neighborhoods entail? Well, it was working, <clears throat> working and living in uh, low-income communities where there were a lot of challenges. And our job as organizers were to create uh, grassroots organizations in those communities to increase their voice in the political system and to advocate for reforms that, that they thought were important. You mentioned challenges. What did you mean by challenges in those communities? Well, you, you see a lot of the problems firsthand uh, when you live and work in, uh, you know, in poor communities where there are lots of uh, uh, issues that need addressed. And I think for me, seeing the weakening of the uh, seeing the weakened state of community and family institutions in those communities in some ways was the, especially the, the role of, uh, especially how children were living without their fathers, it caused me to be particularly interested in that issue and to then led me to my next round of work. Okay, well, and, and what was that? <clears throat> 
Well, I started uh, with some colleagues. I started an organization uh, called that. This is we're now in up to 1987. I started an organization called Institute for American Values, which is a, a nonpartisan think tank that it works on. Uh, our primary focus is on issues of uh, marriage, family, and child well-being. And what is what is your position in the Institute uh, for American Values? I'm the president. And could you explain the type of work that uh, that the institute uh, does? Well, we <clears throat> commission uh, research usually by putting together teams of scholars that would work on uh, projects for one, two, three or years or more. Uh, to, then we would release the findings of that work. We hold uh, conferences, and we. Uh, I would say perhaps our signature product is what we call a report to the nation, and that's where uh, an interdisciplinary team of scholars tries to tackle what we consider to be an important issue, working very intensively for a fair period of time. And then they, uh, uh, they jointly uh, release uh, these, um, these findings and these uh, recommendations. And what are the... What are the subject matters uh, that uh, the Institute focuses on? Well, as I mentioned, the main subjects would be fatherhood, marriage, family structure, child well-being. Uh, in recent years, we have added uh, several other issues to our agenda, but that has, was the, has always been the, our primary uh, area of concentration. And do you, does the Institute uh, produce any regular publications? <clears throat> we produce an annual report called the State of Our Unions, which is a, a report on the state of marriage in America. And we produce a periodic report. We're working on the third edition now called Why Marriage Matters, Conclusions from the Social Sciences. But uh, that latter report, what, uh, what does it uh, address, seek to address? We, we've got, we pulled together about 15 scholars from different fields in the social sciences and from different points of view on the political spectrum and had them work together very uh, carefully to come up with a consensus statement on what they felt were, were the, uh, social, the principal social science findings regarding uh, marriage as, as an institution. And we are, we've published the two editions now. We, we renew them as more research becomes available, and now we're working on the third edition. Mr. Blankenhorn, uh, are you personally involved in the Institute's research and uh, publications and its other work? Y yes, sir. Either uh, in some cases as a principal writer or investigator, and in other cases more as the uh, <clears throat> Uh, in the capacity of, identif of identifying the teams of scholars and working with them to refine the, the topic and then working with, with them in a non-leadership capacity as they do their work and as they then release the results of their work. And is, is there a subject matter uh, or field that uh, you devote your personal efforts to uh, in connection with that uh, with with your personal involvement in those projects? M marriage, fatherhood, family structure. <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn, have you authored any books? Yes, sir. I uh, authored relevant to this um, topic. I authored a book in 1995 called Fatherless America. That was a study or a, a book about the consequences of having approximately 35 percent of U.S. children living apart from their fathers, and it pointed to, I argued that this was a serious social problem. And then in uh, 2006, I published a book called, or 2007 rather, published a book called The Future of Marriage that just looks at uh, what is happening to marriage today and how we might take steps to, to strengthen it in the future. Okay, well, I, I want to uh, explore a little further uh, both, of those, uh, both of those books. Let's start with the Fatherless America. Uh, describe the research you undertook in connection with writing that, uh, that book. I did uh, interviews with fathers in uh, 
six different cities around the country and used the transcripts of those interviews as bases for writing portions of the book. And I conducted a literature review of the scholarship at that time on the role of fathers in the lives of children. That was a basis. And uh, thirdly, I convened uh, scholarly uh, conferences or gatherings where commissioned papers were produced and we would discuss these papers on different aspects of fatherhood and father absence and that those discussions and working with the scholars in that way also furthered my my thinking about the topic um, and did your book fatherless america receive any commentary or what kind of reaction did it receive when it was published i think it's fair to say that it was widely and generally respectfully reviewed in the new york times and washington post book world and la times chicago tribune wall street journal newsweek u.s news and world report it was featured on the cbs evening news it was it was it was it was widely reviewed and did it, did it occasion any appearances on your part in connection with the discussion of the book? It led to quite a bit of public speaking at universities and civic groups and elsewhere. Uh, and I think you said it, it was reviewed. Uh, 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 a, a Dr. Michael Lamb uh, has testified in this uh, case. Uh, did he review your book? Yes, he reviewed it in one of the uh, professional journals, and uh, he disagreed with uh, some of its findings, but said some respectful things about it as well. Well, and in fact, I'd like to publish to the to the screen, Your Honor, if I may, uh, demonstrative uh, number one. <clears throat> uh, now, on the screen, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, uh, is this the uh, is this among the things that Mr. Lamb said? This is among the nicer things he said. Yes. May I inquire whether the review is in evidence? I don't know. It rings a bell. I must say. I think we have seen this before. I could be mistaken, of course. All right. You, Mr. Thompson and I have seen it. Good, good, Your Honor. Thank you. <laughs> and, Your Honor, I, I believe uh, Mr. Blankenhorn's book, Fatherless America, is in evidence. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there may have been some confusion about its its uh, exhibit number, uh, but I believe it's in evidence. And and. Uh, Witnesses' book or the blank or the uh, Lamb article? The Witnesses' book, Fatherless uh, America. And that's exhibit number? Um, Your Honor, it's uh, Defense Exhibit 103. Thank you. DIX 103. Very well. Now I, I'd like to turn to uh, the other book you mentioned, The Future of Marriage. Would you turn to uh, tab two of your book? I am I'm in of your witness binder here and would you describe what you find there well that's a, a picture of the cover of the book uh, the future of marriage and uh, as I said it was from 2007 and talks about what is happening to marriage and what the consequences of these trends are and it rec makes recommendations on how we might as a society seek to strengthen the institution. And could you describe how you researched and prepared uh, to, to uh, uh, author this book? I uh, spent some concentrated period of time with some guidance from some colleagues uh, trying to immerse myself and become familiar, uh, a literature review, conduct a literature review of the anthropological literature related to fatherhood as I'm sorry marriage as a cross-cultural institution and uh, I conducted a series of consultations with an interdisciplinary group of scholars 
uh, three of them uh, in different parts of the country to discuss the issue and then I just also consulted my own uh, accumulated uh, body of having read and written and spoken about this issue for about the past 20 years. Uh, and this book, The Future of Marriage, did it receive uh, commentary when it was published as well? It did. It was not as widely reviewed um, as Fatherless America, but it did uh, receive some uh, attention from reviewers, and um, it also caused me to be invited to do quite a bit of public speaking and to engage in conversation with uh, uh, in, in the book, I uh, argued that we should not uh, adopt same-sex marriage, and so the book caused me to be invited to participate in lots and uh, quite a number of conversations with proponents of adopting same-sex marriage. And um, I think in a way that might have been the most interesting and important outcome in terms of the uh, public impact or public, or, you know, the results of the book. I'd like to publish now a demonstrative number two uh, with respect to uh, the commentary on your book. Um, and, uh, Your Honor, for the record, uh, if, if the court please, I'll just read that uh, 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 Mr. Dale Carpenter, Professor Dale Carpenter, University of Minnesota law professor, said that of the book, probably the best single book yet written opposing gay marriage, Blankenhorn is a serious scholar and thinker. And then Professor F Francis Fujiyama uh, had this to say, David Blankenhorn enormously deepens the current debate on same-sex marriage by recovering the historical understanding of marriage as a public institution designed to promote and foster procreation and the raising of children, an understanding based not on religious conviction, but on observation of how our species has evolved over time. It is a thoughtful and important addition to the contemporary debate. Are these among the, the comments that uh, your book uh, generated? These are. These mean something important to me because Fukuyama is an internationally respected scholar, author of many books. Uh, professor Carpenter is a uh, prominent law professor who is a um, very active proponent of gay marriage. So when he says it's the best book against, he, he might have been damning with faint praise a little bit from his point of view, but it was a very generous thing for him to say. Uh, Your Honor, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Blankenhorn's book, The Future of Marriage. It is uh, uh, it marked as DIX 956. Hearing no objection, 956 is admitted. Thank you. Uh, I'd also now like to publish to the uh, uh, to the screen demonstrative number three, and in uh, that connection, ask you if you have edited any books on subject matters relevant to the to your testimony today. Yes, sir. Well, I thought there were four: the uh, Black Fathers in Contemporary American Society, which I co-edited with uh, Obi Clayton and Ron Mincy, who were two prominent uh, African American uh, sociology professors. Uh, the Book of Marriage, which I co-edited with Dana Mack, who worked with me at the Institute at the time, uh, Promises to Keep and Rebuilding the Nest are both groups of essays, which I co-edited, and they, each essay, each of these books uh, is a compilation of scholarly essays examining the status and future of marriage. Uh, have the books that you have written or edited been reviewed in any peer-reviewed academic journals? Well, I counted up recently, and there were uh, over 50 citations in peer-reviewed uh, academic journals, and I believe there were um, reviews in uh, seven, uh, book reviews in seven uh, journals, including the Journal of Marriage and the Family and uh, social uh, family relations and uh, those journal of family relations being uh, journal of marriage in the family being the most prominent journal in the field of um, 
uh, when it comes to uh, sociology of the family. So yes, there were some uh, a, a number of reviews and also uh, a number of citations in peer-reviewed journals. I, and I, I just just to be clear, uh, uh, if I understood your testimony correctly, it's been your book has been actually reviewed in, in you say seven times, but it's been cited uh, over fifty times in peer-reviewed journals. Yes, seven uh, seven reviews, and uh, I think about fifty three citations uh, of the works in peer-reviewed journals. Has your scholarship e ever been cited in any reported judicial opinions? Uh, it's been cited five times in uh, court cases, including by the California Supreme Court and by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. And were those citations in the same-sex marriage cases in those? Both of the latter two were with respect to the same-sex marriage cases, yes, sir. <clears throat> I see on your CV that you are a member of the National Commission on America's Urban Families. Could you describe that, uh, that commission, please? That commission was appointed by President George Bush, the 41st president, in 1992 to examine the state of America's urban families and to issue a report to the president. Uh, I was one of about seven members. The chairman of that uh, committee was then Governor John Ashcroft of Missouri, the vice chairwoman was uh, former Mayor Annette Strauss from Dallas, and we met s six or seven times when we issued our report in January of 03, uh, of 93, excuse me. Have you ever served in any other advisory role to federal governmental officials? I was asked uh, during the President Clinton's administration, I was asked by Vice President Al Gore to help to work with him uh, in a program called Family Reunion which was focused on family issues, and it was a conference that the Vice President sponsored and chaired in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, each summer during that period of time. And I was asked, I was one of uh, a, a number of people to be asked by him to meet with him, to help him develop the agenda and to participate in that conference. The theme of the conference that year was fatherhood. And the National Fatherhood Initiative is listed on your CV. What is that? That is a, a, a group that was founded by me and several other people uh, in 1995, I believe, was the first time we had a meeting, 96 perhaps. Uh, it's to raise consciousness and to, really, I guess, inform public opinion about the importance of active, involved fathers in the lives of children. I was the founding chairman. Uh, earlier in your testimony, you mentioned that you uh, had done some speaking. Have you, have you uh, delivered uh, 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 lectures uh, in, in academic settings? Yes, I have, uh, quite often over the years, yes. And, 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 and these have been on the subject matters that we're discussing now? Marriage, fatherhood, family structure. And have you have you been invited to participate in uh, debates or panel discussions uh, uh, on the subject uh, specifically of marriage and or same sex marriage? Yes, uh, I'd say quite a few times. <clears throat> I've had a chance to meet and engage in conversation on this issue with. Uh, some of the leading uh, proponents of same-sex marriage, uh, Evan Wolfson, Andrew Sullivan, uh, Jonathan Rausch, others. So you've in engaged in debates with them uh, uh, over the years on this subject matter? Yes, sir. We, we, we try to call them conversations now, but yes, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the issue. And have you provided legislative testimony in these areas? Uh, I believe I've testified either three I've testified three times before either a congressional committee or a state legislative committee on subjects of marriage and fatherhood. Thank you, Mr. Black Blankenhorn. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to tender Mr. Blankenhorn as an expert on the subjects of marriage, fatherhood, and family structures. Very well. Uh, right here.
Good afternoon, Mr. Blankenhorn. Hello. We haven't met, but my name is David Boys, and I represent the plaintiffs. Um, you um, got a master's uh, degree, um, and that degree uh, was in uh, history, is that right? Yes, sir. Comparative labor history. <clears throat> and uh, you did a thesis for that master's? Yes, sir. And what was that thesis in? Labor history. Uh, was it a particular subject? Yes, sir. I, it, was called, it was a study of two cabinet makers unions in 19th century uh, Britain, and it was published in a peer-reviewed academic uh, book several years after I wrote it. Now, uh, peer-reviewed, you just said. Um, what is your understanding of what a peer-reviewed publication is? It's a publication that prior to it being published is reviewed by uh, competent persons to give uh, to give their views on whether or not first whether or not the article should be published and then if it should whether it requires revisions now other than the thesis that you wrote on cabinet makers in Britain have you ever had a peer-reviewed publication yes sir and what was that? Well, I co-edited a book with uh, Obi Clayton and Ron Mincy called Black Fathers in Contemporary American Society that was published by Russell Sage Press that was a peer-reviewed publication. Anything else? No, sir. Not to the best of my memory, that's, that's uh, it, except it might be of interest to note that in my own organization where over the past 20 years many of my pieces of work have been published, we have, to the best of our ability, instituted our own peer review process, and we've been very scrupulous about carrying that out because of our high regard for the entire process. But you do understand that peer review it as is normally uh, used. Uh, I am using it as it's normally used. Uh, it, uh, peer reviewed as it is normally used does not re refer to something that you do internally. It's done by somebody independent, correct? All of our peer reviews are done by external uh, people that have no connection to the institute or the work that we're doing. And are you saying that those independent people peer reviewed your work? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I, I thought I had two pieces of peer reviewed <clears throat> publications. I thought that the import of your question was to exempt from our consideration things that were published by my own organization for reasons that you're implying and I'm happy to stipulate that let's bracket that and just say that ex ex apart from anything that was published by my own organization where you could question if you wish the integrity of the peer review process although I think if you were familiar with it you would not question it but as an outsider you may question it let's bracket that for a moment and just say everybody else we're looking at two publications only. And those two publications didn't have anything to do with same-sex marriage or the effects of same-sex marriage, correct? No, sir. In other words, I'm correct. They, you're correct. They did not. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, you um, uh, have never uh, taught a course in any college or university uh, on marriage, correct? No, sir. And you've never taught a course in any college or university on fatherhood, correct? No, sir. And you've never um, taught a course in any college or university on family structure? No, sir. Um, and do you understand that the fields of uh, psychology and sociology and anthropology are relevant to the subjects of marriage and fatherhood and fa family structure? That is my understanding, yes, sir. And uh, you've never um, uh, gotten any kind of uh, degree in psychology, correct? No, sir. Or in psychiatry? No, sir. Or in sociology? No, sir. Or in anthropology? I think we could go through the whole list because I've enumerated for you all the degrees I have. And um, you've never um, uh, taught any course in any college and university? In I've never been employed by a university or a college. 
to any teach capacity. in any way ever. And um, you said you had testified three times. Um, uh, were any of those three times relating to the effects of same-sex marriage? No, sir. In uh, preparation for your testimony, <clears throat> did you undertake any scientific study of what the effects of permitting same-sex marriage had been in any jurisdiction in which same-sex marriage had been permitted? Specifically in preparation for my testimony, did I undertake such study? The answer to that would be no, sir, I did not. Um, uh, independent of your preparation for your testimony, have you conducted any scientific study as to what the effects of permitting same-sex marriage were uh, in any of the jurisdictions where same-sex marriage was permitted? Well, I have undertaken uh, a study of that question in the best way I know how. Whether or not it would meet your definition of scientific is probably something we might have to explore. I'd be happy to tell you what I did. Well, let's, um, let, let me explore it. Um, you are saying that you undertook a attempt to study what the effects were of permitting same-sex marriage in various jurisdictions where same-sex marriage was permitted. Is that true? No, sir. Okay. I, I want to say what I did do, though, if I may be permitted. Um, let me be sure I've got answers to my questions first, though, okay, sir? Um, I thought you were asking me, did I undertake, independent of this preparation for testimony, I thought your question was, did I undertake any effort to understand the likely consequences of adopting same-sex marriage? And I wish no, to tell you that no. I did. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'd like to answer questions that I'm not asking, sir. Um, and, and you'll have a chance to do that with your counsel. But I'd like you to listen to the question I'm asking you, okay? Um, because I think your question kind of slided over a couple of words. My question was whether you had conducted any study in connection with your expert work or otherwise of the effects of permitting same-sex marriage in the countries where same-sex marriage was permitted. That begins with a yes or no answer. I don't think I'm able to answer that question, yes or no, if those are my only two choices. Um, um, well, the, the question is whether you have uh, attempted to study the effects of same-sex marriage in the jurisdictions where they have been permitted. You have either attempted to do that or not attempted to do that. It may very well have been now that you attempted to do something entirely different or even related to it. But I'm not asking about that. May I understand? tell you what I did do? I'd like you to answer my question, sir. Now, do you understand what my question is? No, sir, because... Let me answer. If you don't understand my question, any time you don't understand my question, please let me know. I'm letting you know now. Okay. Now, let me try to be as clear as I can. You are aware that there are some jurisdictions that have permitted same-sex marriage. I am so aware. Okay. Now, um, have you studied any of those jurisdictions to try to determine what the effect of permitting same-sex marriage in those jurisdictions has been subsequent to the time that same-sex marriage was adopted? Answer to your question is yes. Okay. As long, as long as you answer yes, then I can begin to ask more questions. Um, I'm just afraid that you won't accept my definition of study, and I don't want to try to say something that is, 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 doesn't meet your definition of a study. Well, I will explore that. I will explore that. Um, uh, but, but I'd like to do it in an orderly way. And the first thing I'd like to do is 
I'd like you to identify which jurisdictions you have in your interpretation of the word studied, studied. I've tried to pay some attention to the evolution of the of this uh, phenomenon of same-sex marriage in the Scandinavian countries, and I have tried to pay some attention to <clears throat> the impact of same-sex marriage in Massachusetts, but what I was trying to say before is that I have not engaged in a scientific study where I find data and in, in, in write up of an article or that would be published of, of that nature. I, I have not done those things. That's what I was trying to say. I have not done those things. I have just read articles and had conversations with people and tried to be an informed person about it. But that is really the extent of it. I haven't developed a, a, a methodology or a set of expert uh, you know, findings about the, the topic that you're, I have not done that, the topic that you're dis asking me to address. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I would object. The objection is that the witness is not qualified to opine on the subject of marriage, fatherhood, and family structure, correct? Yes, and in <coughs> uh, with respect to Effect of same-sex marriage, uh, which is what he is being proffered to do within those general subjects. Mr. Cooper, any further foundation for the opinion testimony that the witness is prepared to offer? Your Honor, I think if the court will permit the witness to testify, the court will uh, observe and hear the foundation for his uh, judgments and can certainly reserve judgment. Uh, but. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, I, I understand, and I may very well do that, but the question is whether you want to lay any further foundation for his expertise. The subjects of marriage, uh, family structure, and fatherhood. Uh, and same-sex marriage, as Mr. Boyce And, and same-sex marriage. Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. Well, the... Testimony is, of course, governed by the rules of evidence concerning opinion testimony and the cases that the Supreme Court has laid down to guide the court in admitting such testimony. Um, obviously, the standards are somewhat different in the physical sciences than they are in the social sciences. Relevant to the social sciences, as I understand the standards that have been adopted by the Supreme Court and by the Courts of Appeal, <clears throat> the Court looks to whether the work that the witness has done meets the standards of intellectual rigor using criteria much like those that have been developed in the Daubert uh, case and the Daubert line of cases, whether the proffered testimony is based upon the expert's special skills, that is, special skills as opposed to the insights of an intelligent layperson, and whether the proffered testimony will assist the trier of fact to understand or determine a fact, uh, which is an issue in the case. With respect to Mr. Blankenhorn's qualifications, were this a jury trial? I think the question might indeed be a close one, but this being a court trial, I'm going to uh, permit the witness to testify, and as Mr. Cooper has suggested, to weigh that testimony in light of the witness's qualifications, his background, training, and experience, and the reasons that he offers for his opinions. So you may proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn. What is marriage?
Marriage is a socially approved sexual relationship between a man and a woman. And on what do you base that uh, opinion? I base that on the broad consensus findings of the scholars, principally from the field of anthropology, but others as well, who have carefully sought to investigate this question uh, in the modern era. And what does marriage do? Marriage does a number of things, but the most important thing it does is regulate filiation. It establishes who are the child's legal and social parents. And on what do you base that opinion? Same body of evidence. The, the views that have been drawn from scholarly investigations, uh, principally from the field of anthropology, but elsewhere as well, uh, spanning across the, the, the modern uh, era of scholarship. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to publish to the screen demonstrative number four. And uh, I'll present the witness's uh, testimony and his expert opinions, which have been uh, disclosed, of course, to the to the plaintiffs. And, I'd, and for purposes of the record, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, read into the record uh, proposition uh, number one, uh, and then ask the witness questions about that. The primary purpose of merit. Beg your pardon? <clears throat> Maybe you can just jump right into the subject. Well, uh, you, uh, Your Honor, I'd be happy to do that, uh, although I have to say that uh, the uh, plaintiffs led their witnesses throughout the course of the presentation of their case, and uh, on the one occasion when we objected to it, and uh, we recognize that it moved the pace of the Doesn't case along. Uh, Some reading, but uh, <laughs> rather than simply reading from the demonstrative and then asking the witness whether he agrees with this or doesn't agree with it and so forth, it might Perhaps. be helpful if you were taking through in a somewhat more uh, traditional very, very well, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, what is the primary purpose of marriage in human groups? No, we're we're embodied as as male and female. That's the basic division in the species. We we reproduce sexually. We don't, you know, that's that's how uh, how we reproduce. And the <clears throat> marriage is the social institution that rests upon those very primary biological facts. In fact, the famous anthropologist, recently deceased, but very famous anthropologist, Claude Levi-Strauss, once described marriage as a social institution with a biological foundation. And this is really what he was referring to. He was saying that in across societies that we have an interest in having it be insofar as we can make it so that the man and the woman who, whose sexual union makes the child, who are the biological creators of the child, that those same two individuals are also the social and legal parents of the child. And there is only one institution in the world that performs the task of bringing together the three dimensions of parenthood, the biological, the social, that's the caring for the child, and the legal. That institution is, is marriage. It, 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 we think of it in a way, if you don't mind the poetry, we think of it, think, think of it as a gift. 
that we give to children. We say, you as a child are being given this gift of being able to know and be known by the two people who brought you into this world. So this question, this word filiation, or the, the word affiliation, who is the child affiliated with? That, according to the scholars, has been the primary cross-cultural purpose of the institution. It, it, if it wasn't trying, if, if that need was not uh, there, we, we likely would not have the institution at all. So marriage does m many things. There are uh, numerous dimensions to it, of course, and it changes historically and it evolves over time and there's great diversity. But the wonderful finding from from the scholars who've looked at it is that it always is primarily organized in, everywhere in the around the globe to achieve this goal of giving the child to of uniting the the biological social and legal dimensions of parenthood in fixing that but because we know how important this is for children that's really that's really the main um, rationale for why we have the institution. What is the significance uh, of the fact that marriage is a cross-cut cultural, uh, as you put it, uh, uh, institution and exists everywhere? The fact that it exists everywhere, or, or at least nearly everywhere, <clears throat> uh, I think suggests just how important the need must be because the, marriage can look very different in different places and different times but what's so astonishing about this is that it's always doing this thing east west north south a thousand years ago today it's doing this thing so this thing must be pretty important it must be pretty fundamental it must be at the at the very species level critical to our to the society's success it's not just one thing among many and so forth because of its universality in the midst of diversity i think that's a good piece of evidence to suggest the absolutely fundamentally important nature of the need that is being addressed singularly by this institution. When you said earlier this thing, I just want to be clear, what do you mean when you say marriage addresses this thing? The need for the child to know and be known by the two people to make it as likely as we can that the biological parents are also the social and legal parents. That's what I mean by the thing. Blankenhorn, I'd like you to turn to tab three in your binder. Uh, and would you please uh, identify that document? This is from a book by Suzanne Frazier called Varieties of Sexual Experience. And uh, she's a quite prominent anthropologist. I'd like you to invite your attention to page 248, which is the only page uh, excerpted uh, behind the tab there, and it's the, and, and, and specifically to uh, the second full paragraph. And, and if you will, please, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, would you read, uh, read uh, uh, the first three sentences as I count them? My own definition of marriage derives from a review of the careful attempts to define it made by other social scientists, for example, Goff and Goodenough, as well as from my analysis of ethnographic reports of marriage in a variety of societies. I have found that I can most consistently and usefully identify marriage in cross-cultural contexts by using the following definition. 
Marriage is a relationship within which a group socially approves and encourages sexual intercourse and the birth of children. Is this among the uh, scholars that you previously cited and on which you rely for your opinion in the subject matter? This, because of her expertise and also because of its consistency with many, many others. And I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, plaintiff's, this is a plaintiff's exhibit 1626 in evidence. 1626? That's, that's what I, I see here. Plaintiff's exhibit 1626 has additional pages. Not very many. Well, and, I, and I am happy to have additional pages placed on There's no objection. All right, 1626 is in. <laughs> it's a lot more than one page. <laughs> All right. I just have one excerpt here in the, in the uh, And uh, would you please, please now turn to the document behind tab four, Mr. Blankenhorn. It's a history of marriage systems by Rabina Quayle, who's a historian. Okay. And uh, would you uh, turn your attention, please, to page two of the pages that are excerpted there. And in particular, uh, I invite your attention to the fourth paragraph on that page. If you read the two sentences that begin that paragraph, if you will, please. Marriage as the socially recognized linking of a specific man to a specific woman and her offspring can be found in all societies through marriage children can be assured of being born to both a man and a woman who will care for them as they mature. This uh, among the works on which you relied to form your expert opinion? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'd like to move into evidence. This is uh, DIX 79. Very well, DIX 79 is admitted. Now turn to the document behind tab 5. This is from the very distinguished sociologist Kingsley Davis, whose book he edited uh, is called Contemporary Marriage. And this is from his introductory chapter to that book. And if you'll turn to page five, please. Second uh, full paragraph on that page. Would you please read uh, 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 the first two sentences? Granted that the unique trait of what is commonly called marriage is social recognition and approval, one must still ask, approval of what? The answer is that it is approval of a couple's engaging in sexual intercourse and bearing and rearing offspring. If you relied on this uh, work uh, in uh, forming your opinion? Yes, sir. And I'd like to introduce uh, this exhibit as well. It's DIX 50 into evidence. Very well. Proceeding out of tab six, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn. From the 1951, which is the sixth and final edition of a book, a publication called Notes and Queries on Anthropology. It's put out by the uh, Anthropological Institute of Great Britain which is uh, widely considered to be the most respected group of anthropologists uh, in the world. And if you'll turn to page 71 uh, of that document. First, uh, the first full paragraph, if you read that sentence, please. I meant to say that another thing that's interesting about this book, despite its kind of banal title, is that this is, the, this is a dictionary and a field worker's training guide. These are concepts that are used uh, from senior anthropologists to train young anthropologists as they go into the field for their work. And a lot of it is providing definitions, and here is what they say on marriage. Quote, the family in this sense is based on marriage, which is defined as a union between a man and a woman such that children born by the woman 
are recognized as the legitimate offspring of both partners. You relied on this as well? Probably the most famous definition of marriage in the history of anthropology. Yes, I did. And Your Honor, I'd like to move uh, this exhibit, which is uh, DIX 73 as well, into evidence. Very well, 73 is admitted. We could uh, proceed to uh, the document behind tab 7. A book called Human Family Systems by Pierre Vandenberg, published in 1979. It's an anthropologist. Vandenberg. Anthropologist. Uh, turn your attention to page 46 of that document. And um, at the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, you read uh, the four sentences there, beginning that paragraph into the record. Here I shall argue that while all this is true, marriage is nevertheless the cultural codification of a biological program. Marriage is the socially sanctioned pair bond for the avowed social purpose of procreation. And you relied on this <coughs> source as well? Yes. And I'd like to move uh, this document uh, marked as DAX 89 into evidence. Nine, I'm sorry, 89, DIX 89 is admitted. Now, uh, the document behind tab 8, if you'll uh, describe that, please. This is from a book called Sex, Culture, and Myth, published in 1962 by Bronislaw Malinowski. Malinowski uh, is, uh, I think, widely and fairly viewed as the father of kinship studies in anthropology. Of what, sir? The father of kinship studies, the study of kinship. Kinship. Kinship, yes, sir. You turn to page 11 of that document. <clears throat> the first lines uh, on the page. We are thus led at all stages of our argument to the conclusion that the institution of marriage is primarily determined by the needs of the offspring, by the dependence of the children upon the parents. You relied on this authority as well in forming your opinions. I made a pretty close study of Malinowski because of his importance in the field, so yes, sir. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce as well this document, which is DIX 66 into evidence. Very well, 66 is admitted. If you'll turn now to tab 9, I beg your pardon, let's, uh, tab, tab 9 has, uh, has been uh, left empty. Let's skip to tab 10. This is a 1985 book called The View from Afar by the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss. I think you mentioned him earlier in your testimony. One of the giants of the field. Okay. And on page 40 and 41, if you'll uh, turn to those pages. Yes. Bottom of the page of, on 40, if you'll uh, uh, read the passage that begins, The Family. Yes. The Family based on a union more or less durable but socially approved of two individuals of opposite sexes who establish a household and bear and raise children appears to be a practically universal phenomenon present in every type of society. You relied on this uh, authority as well? Yes. And I'd like to move into evidence uh, this document marked DIX 63. No objection, Your Honor. Three is admitted. Are, are, are these uh, the only authorities on which you have studied uh, in, in your examination of the issue of marriage? No. These 
are what I view as representative. I'm not saying that every other person who's ever written about this agrees with what these people are saying, but I view these as representative of what the leading people in the field have concluded about the meaning of marriage, what marriage is. I view these as representative, and I don't know how many we've discussed today, five or six, but you could multiply by 10, and you could, you could get 50 or 60 distinguished people saying, in effect, this exact same thing. And what conclusion do you draw from your review of these and other similar authorities in these fields? My conclusion is that they're correct, that this is what marriage is, and that this is its primary role and contribution to society. Is there an opposing view? Are there, is there an alternative view of marriage's purpose? Yes, there is. And uh, this view is uh, significant, and this opposing view is, I think it's fair to say, also of significantly more uh, recent uh, vintage and more recent uh, uh, prevalence, but it is certainly a, a, a de well-developed and, and, and opposing point of view about what marriage is. And what is that? It, this view is that marriage is fundamentally a private adult commitment. Uh, and on that subject, would you please turn to the document behind tab 11 of your binder? This is from a uh, report called Beyond Conjugality. Recognizing and Supporting Close Personal Adult Relationships. And it was published by uh, the Law Commission of Canada, a distinguished group of Canadian uh, legal professionals, in 2001. And, and what was the purpose of the, of the publication of this document? <clears throat> to offer, to make analyses and to offer uh, recommendations regarding uh, marriage and family law in Canada. And was this in connection with uh, Canada's adoption of same-sex marriage? Well, I would not say that this report was primarily concerned with that topic, but it was certainly concerned with that topic. Did that was one of the issues that the report addresses. You turn your attention to Roman page Roman uh, 18 I've got it and um, on the what appears to be the first full paragraph there or the first indented paragraph in the middle of the page would you please uh, read the material that begins with the second sentence the state's objectives and underlying Contemporary regulation, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. I'm going to start again. The state's objectives underlying contemporary regulation of marriage relate essentially to the facilitation of private ordering, providing an orderly framework in which people can express their commitment to each other, receive public recognition and support, and voluntarily assume a range of legal rights and obligations. And does this statement reflect uh, the view you've described previously as the private adult commitment view of marriage? Yes, sir, and I believe it's significant because it was uh, developed in somewhat precise language by a group of uh, uh, prominent lawyers who, who were pretty... I think, determined to say what they actually meant. Uh, now turn to Tab. That's not always the case with lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that would get a laugh. <laughs> uh, if you'll turn to the document behind Tab 12, please. This is from an article in the Philadelphia... Uh, I did not introduce it. I'm happy to do so. 
This, Your Honor, is uh, the IX ninety three. Is yes. there an objection? Yes. No, no objection. All right, ninety, th- and you are offering ninety three. Yes. All right, ninety three is it? I'm sorry, and, and the, the, the document uh, behind uh, tab 12 again? Uh, this is from an article uh, by Professor Crispin Sartwell, uh, who teaches at Dickinson College. And it's an article that appeared in the, uh, I believe, the Philadelphia Inquirer. You read the, the uh, uh, s- from the first paragraph there in the second sentence. Marriage is sometimes referred to as an institution, but that's an odd application of the term. The Department of Defense is an institution. The University of California is an institution. A marriage is a private arrangement between parties committed to love. And you relied uh, on this as well for your uh, opinion on this subject? Yes, sir. My understanding of this is that it's a more colloquial way of restating exactly the views state offered by the Law Commission of Canada as to the purpose of marriage. You know, this is uh, DIX 84, and we would uh, offer it now into evidence. Very well. 84 is it. Uh, if you'll now turn to the document behind tab 13 of your binder. This is from a book called The Case for Same-Sex Marriage. Uh, it was written by Professor William Eskridge, whose, expertise, whose views were discussed earlier uh, today. He's a law professor at Yale from Yale University. Is he one of the individuals you mentioned that you have been invited to debate on this? Subject? Yes, sir. Okay, will you turn, please, to page 11 of that? And uh, essentially in the middle of the first, uh, the first full par- paragraph, Beginning with, in today's society, we read that, please? In today's society, the importance of marriage is relational and not procreational. And are there other authorities uh, uh, that you have studied that uh, articulate this adult-centric view of marriage as you've described it? The view that uh, marriage is fundamentally a private adult commitment. Yes, sir, there are uh, very, very many examples of of this conclusion uh, being proffered in the public discussion and in the academic discussion, and these are merely a very few of many, many possible representative examples of this this, uh, proposition. I believe that the, this adult-centered view of marriage is an accurate view of the institution of marriage now, today, and and in the past. No, sir, I do not believe it's accurate. I believe that the affective, private dimensions of marriage are often, and including in our own society, a a dimension of marriage, a, an important, even an important dimension of marriage. But I do not believe that it has ever been. The, uh, I, I do not believe that in uh, the in the history of societies it has been understood to be the sum and substance of marriage, the 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 heart and soul, the core, the fundamental uh, thing itself could be encapsulated with this uh, idea that marriage is a fundamentally a private adult commitment. I do not believe that's consistent with, with the human record. I think you use the words, the, uh, the private affective dimension of marriage. What, uh, what did that mean? It just means the tender feelings that the spouses have for one another, the feelings of love and regard and solicitude and emotional uh, commitments that the 
uh, and feelings feelings of commitment and, and obligation and love that these spouses feel to to one another. That was that would be that's the I'm using the term the affective dimension of marriage, and that that dimension. Uh, uh, in in many societies, of course, it's very negligible. There are many societies where many most marriages are arranged, or they're governed by kin groups, or they're in some societies the affective dimension is not is is a very negligible dimension of the institution. But in ours, of course, it, it is that is not true. In our Western tradition in the United States, the affective dimension is is an important dimension and one that we celebrate on Valentine's Day and so forth but it uh, but it is never the the idea that uh, it, that is what marriage is that that's how we understand the institution is I think uh, first of all what these analysts are saying and I think they are are, 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 are incorrect as a matter of our uh, history and our lives, I think they're incorrect in that assertion. They may, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a question of what they wish would happen in the future, that's one question. But if we look at actual lived experience of marriage and human groups, this is not an accurate uh, analysis, in my view. Now I'd like to ask you a, a few questions about uh, why marriage regulates filiation, as you put it. And I'd like to publish to the screen, uh, Your Honor, demonstrative number seven. Um, Mr. Blankenhorn, was, uh, what role has religion played in defining the traditional institution of marriage? If we start with the question of the customary man-woman nature of the marital institution, the idea that marriage brings together the man and the woman, I think the record is completely clear that this concept, which as we know now, or as I am saying, is a universal or nearly universal uh, presence in human societies, uh, this feature of marriage uh, simply is not the creation uh, of religion. It is not something that religion uh, invented. It does not depend upon religion for its rationale or its, uh, uh, its uh, people having allegiance to it. Uh, it, 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 its evolution in our species cannot be explained with reference to religion. And that fact is borne out by us realizing that marriage is a natural human institution. That is, it, it concerns itself with natural facts, not supernatural facts. It, and it exists in societies that have uh, monotheistic uh, based religions, societies that uh, believe in what we in the West might call magic or, 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 or witchcraft. Uh, you know, you could, the, the variety of beliefs about the supernatural in the human experience is breathtakingly diverse. And yet in all of these societies, the man and the woman form something called marriage. And it simply is erroneous to imagine uh, that this foundational aspect of the institution is the artifact of a particular religious doctrine or of religion generally. And I further believe that what I have just said is non-controversial among scholars. I, I simply do not think that this is a controversial statement among people who have looked at this. You don't, uh, you, you, you don't disagree, do you, that uh, uh, marriage is uh, sacred to many, inst uh, many religions, uh, modern religions? Well, of course. I mean, marriage, uh, a religion, is a very powerful influence in human affairs in all areas of life, and marriage is no exception. 
And so, for example, in so many societies, we see that individuals who marry, they believe that that promise is in part a sacred promise. They believe that they are promising something to God or to a higher power in addition to the promise to the spouse. And many people uh, have a uh, religious, um, uh, you know, they, they mar the, the marriage ceremony occurs in a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Uh, and so, of course, uh, and sometimes religious officials are also agents of the state in actually legally performing the, the, the marriage, uh, legally performing the marriage. So there is, uh, in these in many other ways, uh, uh, in turn, oh, in many people draw from religion the, 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 the inspiration to live up to the calling of the marital vocation and so forth. So with these and other ways, there is a strong sense, of certainly in our, in our nation, and I would say generally across the world, uh, there is a, this, this interconnection or this, I guess you might say, this strong influence of uh, religion on this dimension of life. Uh, you might call marriage in so many societies a, a, a religiously uh, informed uh, institution in some ways, but I, I'm trying to make the distinction between that and saying that the thing itself, the, the marriage institution itself, particularly its man-woman basis, which is universal, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be very clear that this does not derive from religious doctrine. It does not derive from the concept of religion. It does not derive from any ideas about the supernatural. It is what scholars call a natural institution. It derives from facts of our embodiment and reproduction that do not call upon supernatural beliefs for their, for their coherence. Do you believe that the customary man-woman definition of marriage is attributable in, in, in some fashion or some way to uh, uh, anti-homosexual uh, prejudices or hostility? I do not. I believe that homophobia is a real presence in our society and I'm pretty confident in many, many other societies around the world and I regret and deplore it and wish it to go away. As I have sought to look at the reasons for the evolution of marriage in human societies, as I've sought to understand and wrestle with the evidence about why marriage evolved in the first place, how it became institutionalized through law and custom, how it became universal in its reach and impact, and how those custodians of the institution over time, across time and around the world, have sought with words both written and oral to state the reasons for the institution, the purposes of the institution, the goals of the institution, what the thing was trying to do and why it mattered so much. I am not able to find any evidence that animus toward gay and lesbian people or that uh, hatefulness toward um, homosexual, homosexual persons I am not able to find evidence that that was a central component of how they understood their activities, how they understood their commitment to the marital institution, why they justified their participation in the marital institution, or why they established the laws and customs surrounding the institution that they did. Now, I am not saying that no such evidence exists. And if evidence, such evidence exists, I would welcome 
I would I want to know it, I, but I, I'm telling you that I have looked for it, and I I cannot find it. Well, to return now then to your earlier testimony that marriage is designed, I think as you put it, to regulate filiation. Um, why does it matter whether the child is raised by his or her own biological parents? Well, it matters for two large clusters of reasons, and I'll just go into this very briefly. But the first one it, it somewhat accords with our, our common sense understanding of things, but the scholars have given it the, a name uh, called kin altruism, and it really means you know, you care a lot about who you're related to. You care about your relatives. You, you care about who your parents are, or who your child is, and you would be, they've measured this with great precision. You, you, you typically sacrifice more for people to whom you're related. You typically uh, extend yourself, whether it's risking your life or loaning money or inconveniencing yourself on their behalf, uh, they've really looked at this fairly carefully and this notion of kin altruism means that in humans, because we um, seem to be, uh, we, we seem to care a lot about where we came from physically and we seem to care a lot about the people to whom we are related, particularly closely related. So that um, if you have a, a child a, 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 to, to, to be cared for, by, if you had your druthers, and you would, for, for this reason, you would want, if you wanted what was best for the child, you would want that child, other things being equal, of course, you would want that child to be cared for by the two individuals who are most closely related to the child. And that would be the child's mother and the child's father. And of course, that's how we humans have organized ourselves for millennia now. Uh, the second body of evidence on this concerns child outcome studies. And here we shift now to the field principally of sociology. And we're not looking at motivation. We're not looking at the self-sacrificing nature of kinship. We're just looking at outcomes for the children. In here, there is a very large body of literature. My own organization has been quite involved in this kind of work now for 20 years, and uh, there's many, many others, scholars and uh, researchers, who have pursued this quite carefully. And I would say that there is a uh, broad consensus among the scholars in this field and I would further say that this consensus grows stronger almost every year because of the accumulating weight of evidence that the optimal environment for children is if they are raised from birth by their own natural mother who is married to their own natural father. And of course, one wants to say that this isn't always possible. Sometimes this family form uh, fails. Sometimes alternative uh, family forms different than that succeed. When we get to the level of, of specificity and in individual cases, uh, there is quite a bit of complexity to the situation. And the scholars have spent many <laughs> years and much uh, effort trying to tease all of this out. But if you just look at the weight of evidence and you look at the most distinguished, well, I, th I think among the, I believe the most distinguished scholars in this field, they are increasingly clear and emphatic that based on the available evidence today, it is clear that, in, that the optimal outcome for children in terms of outcomes, the optimal environment for children in terms of outcomes, whether it be the likelihood of living in poverty, whether it be the likelihood of mental and emotional distress and, and suffering, whether it be a juvenile delinquency or educational achievement or occupational success 
are the likelihood of experiencing uh, 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 abuse and neglect uh, that across the range of outcome measurements that this family form of the two biological parent married couple home in a stable marriage is the best model from the child's point of view. Well, in that connection, I'd like you to <clears throat> turn to the document behind tab 15 in your binder. Identify that document when you, you've reached it. This is a, a summary in the form of a research brief of research carried out by a group of scholars, a group of uh, uh, three scholars from Child Trends. It is a nonpartisan uh, research group in Washington, D.C. And this uh, brief, this summary of research was published in, I believe, uh, uh, I believe 2002. And it's called Marriage from a Child's Perspective. Turn to page six, please. Yes. And in the right-hand column, uh, about halfway down the page, the paragraph beginning first, would you please read that uh, uh, for the court? Research clearly demonstrates that family structure matters for children. And the family structure that helps children the most is a family headed by two biological parents in a low-conflict marriage. Children in single-parent families, children born to unmarried mothers, and children in step-families or cohabiting relationships face higher risks of poor outcomes than do children in intact families headed by two biological parents. Parental divorce is also linked to a range of poorer academic and behavioral outcomes among children. There is thus value for children in promoting strong, stable marriages between biological parents. And was this uh, among the uh, uh, research uh, that you have uh, consulted and relied upon in arriving at your opinions in this matter? Yes, because of the uh, reputation of the child trend scholars, because it was a summation of work done by a number of them over time, and because, uh, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll just stop there, but yes, it is. And, and would, uh, you're on a, this document is already in evidence, to, uh, to my understanding. Very well, 26 is in. Uh, turn now uh, to the document behind tab 16, please. This is a book called Growing Up with a Single Parent. It's by Sarah McClanahan and her colleague Gary Sandifer, and it was published by Harvard University Press in 1994. McClanahan is one of the most prominent family sociologists in the country. She teaches at Princeton. And, and please turn to page one of the, of the document. Paragraph. The uh, third sentence, will you read that sentence to the, uh, about the uh, We have been studying this question for 10 years, and our opinion, and in our opinion, the evidence is quite clear. Children who grow up in a household with only one biological parent are worse off on average than children who grow up in a household with both of their biological parents. Regardless of the parent's race or educational background, regardless of whether the parents are married when the child is born, and regardless of whether the resident parent remarries. And was this document among those you have relied upon? <clears throat> yes, sir. Your Honor, this too is in evidence already. Well, Mr. Blankenhorn, does the customary man-woman uh, definition of marriage uh, benefit only the child? 
Well, it certainly benefits the child, but it also benefits uh, the mother and the father and society as a whole. The mother, uh, because it lessens the likelihood of her having to raise the child alone and isolated. The father, because it connects him to his own child and to the mother of his child, connects him to the process of generativity in a way that would be unlikely for him to achieve any other way. And society as a whole, because these are the family units that are most likely to produce good outcomes for children and thus be a kind, the kind of seed beds from which come uh, good citizens and people who are you know, more likely to be you know, positive contributors to society. Uh, so the, it, it's a human cap, the kind of human capital question. It's the highest level of investment that we can make in children is to, is to give them the great gift, really, of growing up in this family form. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, guarantee success. And growing up outside of this form certainly does not guarantee failure, but it shifts the odds in a very dramatic way that has been very carefully documented by the scholars. I'd like to turn now to uh, the concept of deinstitutionalization. I'd like to publish to the screen, Your Honor, uh, demonstrative number eight. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, could you please describe this concept of deinstitutionalization? It's a term that comes from sociology. It has scholars who study it. There's a literature on it. The first paper I ever worked on at the Institute was called Marriage in America, published in 1995, and we, it anchored, it centered uh, in part, in large part, on the concept of deinstitutionalization. I wish it was a prettier word to say or, or listen to. But what it really means is that you have an institution which can be briefly defined as a relatively stable pattern of rules and structures intended to meet social needs. This is what, in brief, we think of when we think of a social institution. Marriage is, a social in, is one social institution. The concept of deinstitutionalization is when, to speak briefly, that institution weakens. That institution becomes frailer. Its rules become thinner or are, are, are removed altogether, and therefore the rules that govern the institution become less comprehensible and clear and less, therefore less authoritative. And when its structures become less stable, less able to give uh, a, a robust shape to the institution, it's like a kind of a shrinking process. And as a result of deinstitutionalization, you don't have to think about marriage. You could think about you know, a baseball team or a museum or any, any institution. When you take away its rules and you weaken its uh, structures, scholars say that you're seeing deinstitutionalization and so that the people, the participants in the institution or the possible participants in the t institution become over time less loyal to it, less, un they, they understand it less. They, they, some of them, uh, they increasingly, the institution loses esteem in the society, it loses respect, it loses its sense of being held in high regard and the institution becomes less and less able to carry out its contributions to the society. This uh, concept of deinstitutionalization is, um, I think, a, 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 a critical one for people who are studying the status and future of, of any institution. Uh, but in particular, it has been of great value to scholars looking at at recent trends in marriage because in the United States, particularly in recent decades, the last three, four, five decades, there has been a marked process of deinstitutionalization of marriage 
with very numerous and serious consequences for children and for society as a whole. So it's an absolutely pivotal concept if we want to understand where the institution is going and what opportunities we may have to, 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 to come to its aid. Well, I think you, you did just now testify that the institution of marriage is, uh, has uh, been weakened, I think, uh, to, to paraphrase your testimony, by deinstitutionalization already. What are some of the manifestations of that uh, process? Well, if you look, for example, at rates of out-of-wedlock childbearing, you know, five or six decades ago, only a small fraction of U.S. children were born to unmarried parents, whereas the most latest data tell us that today about 38 percent of children in the U.S. are born to unmarried parents. So that, over a say a five decade period, if you go back to 1960, that would be a very dramatic example. That rate of growth over a five decade period, what I think what constitutes a very dramatic example of the weakening of the marriage institution. You also would need to look at rates of divorce. The United States has probably the highest divorce rate in the world. And so uh, as a result, people are uh, uh, the, the weakening of the ideal of marital permanence uh, suggests a lessening loyalty to the institution uh, and you, the rise of non-marital cohabitation, uh, the uh, increasing uh, mainstreaming of uh, third-party participation in procreation and artificial uh, uh, assisted reproductive technologies that uh, disturb the bond between the, the disturb the bond the biological bond between the, the genitor and the child uh, uh, and last but for our purposes certainly not least the the, uh, the, the spread of the idea and reality of same-sex marriage in the, the view of uh, I think the view of leading scholars is another uh, aspect or manifestation of this current trend of the institutionalization. And I, I, you know, I meant to say, just for our purposes today, you know, heterosexuals, <laughs> you know, did the deinstitutionalizing. I mean, you know, if we go back and look at the trends I've described, it, it's very clear that this was, uh, this was not, uh, deinstitutionalization is not something that just cropped up a few years ago whenever we began discussing the possibility of extending equal marriage rights to gay and lesbian people. It, 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 it predates all that. But what I am saying is that the scholars are telling us uh, that the process of deinstitutionalization would be furthered and accelerated significantly by adopting same-sex marriage. Well, what impact, in your opinion, uh, would de redefining marriage to include same-sex couples uh, have on marriage in this deinstitutionalization process? It's hard to know because you're in some important ways, you know, predicting what will happen in the future. My best judgment is that if we move toward a widespread adoption of same-sex marriage, I believe the effect will be to significantly further and in some respects uh, culminate the process of deinstitutionalization of marriage. Uh, it, it, if, if you take an institution that for all of its long history has been understood to have defined 
public purposes. And through changing its definition, you transfer it from the public, you transfer it from a child-centered public institution to an adult-centered private institution, pri pri a question of private ordering among couples, you have in some ways, uh, you know, completed, that, that's a culminating trend toward the erasure of marriage's public defined contribution to society. And uh, uh, I think that it's likely that, um, you know, that, as I say, this did not trigger the trend of deinstitutionalization. Deinstitutionalization has been with us now for a while, uh, but it's a live issue, and there are many people who would like to reverse the trend. But I think the evidence is quite compelling that if we move toward a widespread adoption of same-sex marriage, we will very significantly accelerate the process of deinstitutionalization, and the consequence of that will be to weaken the role of marriage generally in society, and the consequences of that will be felt by everyone in the society. Mentioned earlier other scholars who uh, have recognized the relationship between same-sex marriage with the prospect of it and deinstitutionalization. I want you to turn now to uh, the document behind tab 17 of your binder. Yes. What is that, please? This is an article by uh, Andrew Churlin, who's a prominent family sociologist. He teaches at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a proponent of same-sex marriage, and this article is entitled the deinstitutionalization of American marriage. Could you turn to page 850 of that uh, excerpt? And if you'll look in the right hand column of the page, uh, the first, uh, first par full, full paragraph there, would you read the first sentence? The most recent development in the deinstitutionalization of marriage is the movement to legalize same-sex marriage. And is, uh, this, uh, is this authority among those you've relied upon to arrive at your judgment on this subject? Yes. Your Honor, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this document is marked as DIX 49. I'd like to offer it into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. DIX 49 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And if you'll continue in your binder to the document behind uh, tab 18. Yes, this is a uh, article called The Struggle for Same-Sex Marriage, written by Professor Norval Glenn, who's a uh, prominent family sociologist from the University of Texas at Austin. This was published in 2004. Turn to uh, page 26 of that of that document, please. And in the right-hand column at the top of the page, if you'll uh, read the passage beginning with the word however, please. However, acceptance of the arguments made by some advocates of same-sex marriage would bring this trend to its logical conclusion namely, the definition of marriage as being for the benefit of the couple who enter into it, rather than as an institution for the benefit of society, the community, or any social entity larger than the couple. And was this among the uh, sources that you relied upon for your thinking on this? Yes, and I, it may be worth noting that these two authors who have just I've just cited uh, are both prominent scholars but they are on opposite sides of the policy question on whether we should adopt gay marriage and are there others who uh, who have uh, identified this 
uh, the, this phenomenon of deinstitutionalization of marriage in connection with same-sex marriage? Yes. Your Honor, uh, this document is marked DIX 60, and I'd like now to offer it into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 60 is admitted. And would you remind me just where on page uh, 26 the witness was uh, referring to? I yes, Your Honor. Missed that. Very top of the page of the right-hand column begins with the word however there, the oh. second word on oh. that column. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn, how confident are you that uh, redefining marriage to include same-sex marriage, same-sex couples, would further the deinstitutionalization of marriage? It's impossible to be completely sure about a, a prediction of future events. I don't think anyone can. But I do have a great deal of confidence in the likelihood of the weakening of marriage through the process of deinstitutionalization to a greater degree than would be the case otherwise if we move toward the adoption, widespread adoption of same sex marriage. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, it, it's really just hard to imagine how it could be otherwise. If you change the definition of the thing, it's hard to imagine how it could have no impact on the thing. It, if you change the structure of the thing. It's hard to imagine how you could not have an effect on the content of the thing. And if you decisively move an institution from the public realm to a question overwhelmingly of private ordering rather than public purpose that can be specified, it's hard to imagine a more textbook example of what scholars mean when they say deinstitutionalization. And we do know from evidence that the process of deinstitutionalization has already weakened the marriage and could weaken it more in the future. So while I am, while I don't think anyone here can uh, say that they know from scientific study based on data that they know with absolute certainty that this will happen. I uh, sincerely believe that this is the most, this is a likely outcome. This is a likely result of adopting same-sex marriage. And I'd like to publish uh, now a uh, demonstrative. Uh, my next demonstrative, I think, uh, is number nine, yes. And uh, ask the witness uh, a series of questions. I'm getting close to the end of the examination, Your Honor. A series of questions about uh, the consequences that uh, he believes will likely flow from redefining marriage to include same-sex couples. And uh, the first question I'd like to ask is this. How, in your opinion, would the further deinstitutionalization de of marriage caused by the legalization of same-sex marriage manifest itself in society? Sorry, would you mind... Restating the question. In, in, in what ways, in your opinion, will uh, extending marriage to same-sex couples uh, and therefore, in your opinion, deinstitutionalize, further the deinstitutionalization of marriage, manifest itself in, I see. in society? Well, as, uh, as we've discussed now, 
I I think a likely uh, consequence is a, uh, a, a, a an acceleration of deinstitutionalization or devaluation that would help to produce um, uh, higher rates of non-participation in marriage, higher rates of uh, fragility, uh, one-parent homes, uh, divorce, uh, the, the, the general, uh, you know, all of the, co all of the consequences that we have discussed in the last uh, hour or so on the, of the weakening of the institution related to uh, uh, divorce, non-marital cohabitation, more children outside of marriage, and so forth. Uh, I, I, my, my, uh, uh, my 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 fear, you know, really, and 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 my conclusion is that this this is a likely um, this is a likely outcome. How, in your opinion, would redefining marriage to include same-sex couples impact the traditional uh, view that a child needs both its mother and its father? Well, I've had some personal experience with this because. Since 1995, I, I, I may have spent as much time as anybody in the country saying that children need their fathers. And it seems like it ought to be a simple idea that shouldn't get you in a lot of trouble, but I can tell you it does. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think will happen, and I can already see it beginning to happen, is that simply saying publicly that a child needs and deserves her father uh, will go from being what it is now, which is mildly controversial, uh, will go to being viewed as simply inappropriate public speech, as really beyond the pale, as offensive, as divisive, as, as mean-spirited. And I, I uh, you know, if it's, it's hard for me to, to see how, if you cannot speak publicly about a value, then it's hard for me to see how that could do anything other than to weaken the value over time if you cannot say its name. And I've had... I've had personal experience with this as well as my, my observation, and I may sound simplistic, but simply being able to say that children need, a child needs its mother and father, if that becomes just uh, impermissible in any venue, in a church, a school, a civic group, a PTA meeting, I think we, we lose something precious. Very well, uh, I'll overrule the objection. I, uh, you indicated you were getting close to the end. I, Your, Your Honor, we're, we're, we are approaching it uh, rapidly. Thank you. Uh, what impact, in your opinion, Mr. Blankenhorn, would uh, extending uh, marriage to same-sex couples have on alternative marriage forms? and family structures? I think it would have the impact of further mainstreaming the uh, acceptability and uh, prevalence of alternative family forms. And what in particular do you have uh, in your mind there? You know, when Canada adopted same-sex marriage um, several years ago, they they struck the term uh, natural parent from Canadian law and replaced it with the term legal parent. And the implications of that, I think, are very uh, profound in terms of transfer of power to the state and, and, and so forth. But um, it, it, it indicates that there is a growing uh, trend for for family forms in which the child will not 
be raised by her uh, by her own biological parents. So there's the the diminution, the d diminished likelihood of the of the of there's an I'll say an increased likelihood of children being raised in uh, family forms other than uh, her own two parents, her own two natural parents. There's also the the possibility, uh, you know, I <clears throat> there could be the possibility of more uh, public uh, willingness to consider uh, uh, family forms such as polygamy that involve more than two people. And and uh, what's the what's the basis of your uh, concern about that? Well, I think that po polygamous marriages are not in the interest of women, especially, and also not really in the interest of society. And there's already a standing history of this uh, in our society and many others. And the the concept that marriage involves only two people is the probably the weakest of marriage's uh, core rules. It's already tested significantly by. Uh, polygamy and polyandry and polyamory and so uh, I think if the rule of if, if the concept of opposites you know the concept of man woman goes it's hard to imagine really uh, and this is already being actively you know reviewed by scholars and journals and it's hard to well I'll just put it this way it, it seems likely that over time this 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 aspect of the institution as well will come under uh, criticism and calls for reform. And, and why would redefining marriage as an adult-centric institution, as you've put it, uh, increase the possibility of, of, uh, of this? Of what? Of, of uh, polygamy, polygamy being uh, uh, an acceptable uh, alternative family form? Because the man-woman customary basis of marriage is reinforced by, and is, it in turn reinforces the idea of limiting marriage to two. And if you knock out the uh, one of these pillars, the other one becomes less uh, uh, comprehensible and therefore less defensible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, I'd now like to turn to the last, uh, last subject, and that is the issue of domestic partnerships. And I'd like to ask you what your position is on uh, domestic partnerships. I support them. I think that they could be uh, part of a kind of a humane compromise in which, on the one hand, we uh, protect marriage and allow it to continue to carry out its distinctive contribution to society, uh, while at the same time uh, extending uh, protections and recognition to uh, gay and lesbian couples. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but I do think it's a possible humane compromise on this issue and I so stated in an article that I wrote uh, in the New York Times I co-authored with uh, Jonathan Rausch uh, last year. Who is Jonathan Rausch? Uh, he's a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution. He's a prominent uh, proponent of same-sex marriage and his most recent book is called uh, gay marriage, why it's good for gays, good for straights, and good for America. And when did you publish this article you just referenced in the New York Times? I think it was February of 2009. Have you always held the view that you've just, uh, you've just uh, articulated? No. I, um, I've, I've actually come pretty much full circle on the issue. I really, 
I really hadn't thought about it very much. I was really focused on the topic of marriage, and I had not given the, the topic of domestic partnerships uh, much thought. I certainly haven't, hadn't given it any careful consideration until, until about two years ago. Uh, there was an event in Washington, D.C., a debate. We, uh, we call them conversations now, but it was, we called it then a debate with Jonathan Rausch, and he kind of publicly challenged me and called me out on this topic and said, you're thinking about domestic partnerships is, is, is immature and wrong, and you have to rethink it, and, uh, you know, it's... I've also, speaking... John, Jonathan said he also was ev evolving his position on the topic, and he really challenged me in that forum to... to um, to consider more carefully this idea. And I, I told him that I would, and I did. And that began a kind of a journey with him personally and also with other leaders in the camp, in the push for, who were pro-same-sex pro marriage, where I tried to uh, devote some real uh, some real time to the topic, and uh, that led then to Roush and I writing the article uh, endorsing uh, civil unions or domestic partnerships uh, in the New York Times. Why hadn't you could, had you thought carefully about the issue of domestic partnerships prior to that time? <laughs> I didn't really think I had. I didn't feel that I had to think about them carefully at that time. I. <clears throat> I went into I went into my first conversations about this with a kind of an instinctive or just a general feeling that if you set up a comparable institution to marriage that that could have a weakening effect on marriage because particularly if that comparable institution was open to opposite sex couples as well I was worried that you would have a kind of a uh, you know, smorgasbord effect of, you know, relations, you know, choosing. And I thought that that diversification would possibly weaken the marital institution. So I was, I was, I was very concerned that that not happened. So I was personally um, suspicious of endorsing domestic partnerships for that reason. And the other reason was that the, uh, Roush and the others, the, you know, the, the people I was talking to were just uh, very uh, vociferous in their denunciation of civil unions and domestic partnerships. They thought, they just said it was a, a, a horrible idea, that it was discriminatory, that it was, that this was invidious, this was demeaning to gay and lesbian people, and this was a, un, a form of, you know, unequal treatment. And I uh, I, I accepted that view. I was strongly influenced by that view. In fact, I repeated that view, you know, back of the bus, you know, discriminatory and, 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 and wrong and unfair. And uh, so for those reasons, my concerns about uh, diluting marriage by setting up this dual institutional structure and also the concerns about just the, I guess you might say, the, um, the, the, une the, 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 uh, un the unfairness, the, uh, the idea that this would be uh, discriminatory, I, uh, I, I embraced that, uh, I embraced both of those points of view, uh, just as an initial way of thinking about the topic uh, without having written or thought much about it. But, and it was really then uh, in the meeting with Roush uh, in 2007 and then the next two years, I, uh, I, I tried to rethink it afresh. I tried to think about it deeply and carefully uh, with Roush and others, and that led to the uh, written uh, article about the subject that I, I published with him last year. So I take it you no longer 
uh, you, you no longer agree with the uh, views that you had on this subject before? Still worry that <clears throat> domestic partnerships could could uh, could possibly have a weakening effect on on the marital institution, but I think that it's something we should do anyway because of other issues involved, and I have satisfied myself on this question of uh, fairness. That's been the, the big uh, issue for me, you know, personally. The issue of is it unjust to have a, uh, a, a, a domestic partnership program? That's been really the, the core journey and exploration that I have undergone on that issue. So I, uh, my thinking on it now is that <coughs> the core principle that we can hold out for our understanding is that marriage is, as a social institution, is larger than the sum of its legal incidents. When we say the word marriage, it's a it's a big institution that performs a very large contribution to society, and it's much bigger, much more powerful and potent as a role in society than merely or only the enumeration of its legal incidents. Marriage predates uh, law. Uh, marriage is not a a creature of law in the same way that other things are. The law did not create marriage. We look to law to recognize and support marriage and to give it, give it support. But we do not uh, 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 simply understand the institution only with reference to its legal incidents. So if you look at the legal, uh, the legal incidents of domestic partnerships, and then look at the legal incidents of marriage, the fact that those legal incidents are comparable does not mean that we're looking at the same institution, the content of it. The marital institution is differently purposed, is specifically purposed. As I've tried to say today, probably more times than you want to hear, the purpose of it is to bring together the biological male and the biological female to bring together the, 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 the two genitors of the child to make it as likely as possible that they are also the social and legal parents of the child. That's the lodestar. That's the distinctive contribution. There are others, but that's the distinctive and core contribution of the institution of marriage. The domestic partnership institution is a differently purposed institution with respect to this bringing together with respect to parenthood, particularly with respect to parenthood. The parenting process and the, the, this lodestar notion that animates the marital institution is not the same that is operative in the domestic partnership institution. It is discriminatory and, un, and morally wrong, in my view, morally wrong, to refuse to call two things that are the same by the same name. That was my, that was my, uh, that was my, that was what the big thing I was, had to grapple with in my own mind to be able to look myself in the, in the mirror. And what I worked out with 
Roush and others, I'm, I'm not saying he's responsible for my views. I'm saying that the process I'm describing of developing this proposal with Roush, I had to be sure myself, personally, ethically, that this issue of uh, is this discrimination to have a institution purposed in this way as a domestic partnership institution, uh, I, that was the thing that I, that I had to work out. And I have uh, worked that out to my uh, satisfaction. And, it, and it, it means a lot to me personally. But I, I, I feel that I have been able to understand this in a way that then allows me as an advocate for customary marriage to say we can have a compromise here. We don't all get everything we want, but we all uh, have a, 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 a humane compromise on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Blankenhorn. Maybe we better take a very brief uh, recess for 10 minutes, and then we'll resume with the cross-examination of this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs>